Hi, Troy. It's so great to see. You. I can't believe we're at the end of August again. It just cracks it me crazy? up how fast it goes. You know, because I go, oh, oh goodness. it's dragging. And I'm like, no, it goes fast. It is like so fast already. Mm -hmm. Halloween decorations are going up in the store. Oh, I haven't even looked at that. So, yeah, I don't want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to ignore that one. So I hear you because, yeah. yeah, that means two more holidays. <laughs> yeah. And then we got major ones. New so. Year's. And then, yeah, exactly. So <sighs> we're here. So for those of you joining, we would welcome your questions. Um, put them in the Q&A and uh, we'll, you know, we'll do our best to answer those. So I saw something and I can't remember now. I was going to my life has been a little busy. So, um, but I saw something about, uh, so first of all, we have the Finding Peace work group starting again in September. So th that's a Great. Zoom group, one of our work groups on the uh, Seeking Integrity site. We've got a number of those and we've got some new um, options. Uh, Eddie Caparucci's Why Men Struggle to Love just launched last night. I haven't had a chance to catch up with him to hear how that went, but that group was full. So all of these components. So we've got the Sex Addiction 101 and the Porn Addiction 101 as the beginning foundation things. But then for people who are, you know, on the recovery journey and wanting to to dig deeper and, you know, uh, like the attachment wounds is fabulous, you know, the finding piece. So that starts in September. Um, uh, and, but I saw you had something else going on or something and um, I don't remember. It was, uh, there was something zipping across social media. How's that? So I have a, I have a finding peace retreat happening in Texas in October. So oh. that's the, uh, that's the next big thing that's happening. We just, we had our empathy retreat uh, a couple of weeks ago and that went really well. We Good. Had, um, men who came that was a men's only retreat to help men deepen their capacity for empathy and uh the finding peace retreat is actually co-ed um okay we've learned that having a co-ed actually helps um the opposite gender have more compassion and understanding of the other partner um we i I have contemplating it, doing it just one gender, but every every time I have both uh, men and women um, and non-binary people who have said, "I am I'm so grateful. I I was able to see things in the other that I wasn't able to see before, and it helped me have a deeper compassion and understanding for my relationship with my partner." Um, and so we we do four days of walking them through the finding peace process and it's a beautiful experience so it's going to be in texas this year just south of dallas so so let's talk about who would be an ideal candidate to participate in that anywhere like where would they be on a journey uh anybody who has had wounds like rejection abandonment betrayal loss who is wanting to have a little bit more peace in their life really the purpose is to help them deepen their connection with themselves uh, and so we do we give a lot of tools for shame resilience and helping to to be able to not be hijacked by those shadows of shame so somebody who either a betrayed partner who's done some of their work and wants to take things to maybe a deeper level for themselves or or someone who's in recovery who um, is is wanting to learn how to really connect with their light and not be hijacked by their shame so they can show up better in the relationships that matter for them would be ideal for them so okay that's helpful so so that's a different offering the the work group that we have on the seeking integrity is a six-week course 90 minutes or a few extra um mm -hmm. uh for six weeks you know to just for men no more than 25 you know people from all over the world um but, you know, once a week, you know, to work through that. So a very different experience, but, you know, it's so great that there's resources out there. Um, but, I, you know, like I, 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 I think if you've got questions about where you are in your journey, like if you're just brand new to recovery, you know, that, that may not be a fit, like we don't recommend the finding peace work group until you've got some foundational components. So, um, so having Troy have input, you know, on that may be useful. Yep. Okay. 
we have a question, unfaithful partner, how do I keep from slipping into shame when my partner comes to me with what they're struggling with? How do I listen and show empathy without falling back into shame and defensiveness? So part of what happens, I'm guessing, is that when they start sharing their pain with you, your judge shows up and says, this is all your fault. Mm -hmm. Um, and you uh, you suck and you're a horrible human and how could you have done such a horrible thing? And in that place, then you no longer have capacity to actually hear their pain. So the, the challenge is, number one, being able to recognize, well, who's talking to me? Which shadow is talking to me? It's probably the judge. And then to be able to say, like, well, you're making it all about me right now. And that's what shame really is really good at is it makes it all about you. And right now, the person who's needing something is my partner. My partner is needing love and compassion. Part of the challenge with that, if we understand what the shadows do, is they're always trying to protect you from feeling pain. They're always trying to protect you from that. And, and so what that means is usually, especially if we are early in recovery, and sometimes not even early in recovery, our tolerance for pain is not that great, kind of tiny. And that's why the shadows show up so much to try and help us deal with that. So this is an opportunity to lean into the discomfort of feeling the pain, being able to say to the shadow, hey, look, my partner needs me right now. This is not about me. Um, yes, I know I've made some mistakes and things, and I'm working on rectifying those and making amends and all of that stuff. But this isn't about me right now. This is about them. And so I often use the analogy of like a little kid will come up and they have scab scabbed their knee. They've been riding their bike and they are really excited to show you their alley. And I can say, well, that's not that big a deal. You want to see my scar? Or I can say, uh, man up and stop it crying or I can say oh that looks like it hurts Let, let's wash it off a little bit let's put a band-aid on that let's see what we can do to help preferably I would choose option c um, and doing that and this is the same with your partner they come in and they want to show you their owie it's not necessarily how the owie happened or who did it it's like this hurts and can you hold space and the fact that your partner keeps turning to you for it is a positive sign that they haven't decided to bail out on you yet. So that being able to see that and say, oh, how do I remember that this is about their pain right now and lean into that might help. I have this visual of sticking a Band-Aid on my hand just so I'd remember, oh, this is an owie, you know, just as a, like no owie underneath, but just, you know, the yeah. visual of like, oh, yep, it's an owie. So yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, next question is, I've, I have been in some of your work groups for betrayed partners. I love the process with the worksheet. My question is, is this really about awareness? I know we can't completely heal these wounds. So is there, uh, is the point awareness of the shame wounds and what is going on for each partner? Once that awareness happens, what is the outcome we are looking for? A better way to communicate with our spouse? So I do believe we actually can heal these wounds completely. Um, it, that's a lot of work to do that. But just like your body has the ability to heal wounds in and of itself, sometimes it requires surgery. You know, sometimes we need some intervention to help with, but our bodies are remarkable in its capacity to heal. So I do actually believe that we can heal from these wounds, but sometimes it may take a while. And so it's, it is about awareness. And at the beginning, it's really just identifying, well, what wound is this? Because I maybe haven't done any wound care about this wound. So I have never created an environment in which this wound can heal. Now that I'm aware of it, I can start to put some things in place to help this wound heal. Now, you know, I have a rejection wound and it's pretty big. There are there are pieces of that rejection that have absolutely been healed for me. And I don't carry the animosity. I don't carry the bitterness. 
I don't carry the resentment. Does that mean that rejection wound is completely healed? No, but in some specific cases, it has completely healed. There is in that relationship with that person, it hasn't. There's still a lot of work for me to do still around that. Um, but part of that is recognizing how can I tune in to my own light, my own truth, my own gifts, talents, and abilities, and live within my best, most true, authentic self. And when I connect with that, I'm not as easily wounded. Uh, people will do things and it doesn't affect me as much because I'm recognizing they're wounded. That's their stuff. That's not really my stuff. And I'm able to live in a place that is in my best interest and in the best interest of the people that I love. So the outcome is to really connect with your own sense of worthiness. And when you connect with that, your ability to have boundaries is better. Your ability to love and have compassion is better. Your ability to forgive is better. Your ability to say some things just don't work for me is better. Um, and, and so then you, when you're in that place, Yes, communication is helpful, but it's almost like you don't have to say a lot because it's just exuding from you and the other person just feels it. So the communication is more about um, not having to communicate boundaries, but more just being able to like talk and connect with each other. I, I really appreciate that. The um, And I think the exuding is because you're not coming from a place of defenses, defensiveness or the wounding, you know, you're, you're identifying, yep. But I really like that you're talking, cause I was like, oh, wow, are my wounds healed or how much work? But when you're saying there's pieces, cause I was like, yes. Cause like mine is abandonment. Like who knew until you told me, well, you helped me discover it. Mm -hmm. I, you helped me learn, but having the ability to identify it hugely beneficial. So when this person is talking about the awareness, having the awareness of that's what it is, you know, so that I, you know, own it and don't have to go down the rabbit hole. But also when you're saying pieces, so there's pieces of it that are, are, you know, have been healed. So, so rather than looking at it, it's completely gone or it's not. And, but to have it go, oh yeah, I have made progress and it's way better. And, you know, when it gets poked, it's a little poke instead of the massive, you know, oh my gosh, drama queen, you know? So, um, so I appreciate being able to, to look at it, you know, as progress, you know, rather than, you know, it's all or nothing. That's again, Troy, so hugely helpful. On Thank my personal you. journey of growth. Thank you. I still have lots of work to do. Okay. As a sex addict in recovery and needing to help my wife heal, how can I help my wife heal while she is losing her sister and overwhelmed by both? Oh, I am. That's such, you know, it's such tough stuff. So this is a, um, it's a challenging thing because my initial response is, well, ask her. <laughs> but um, oftentimes when the person is hurting, the last thing they need is for somebody to say, well, what do you need? Uh, because they're already suffering. It's it's too much emotional bandwidth or cognitive bandwidth for them to then tell you what they need. Uh, it's something that's healthy for us to learn how to be able to communicate, communicate our needs um, because none of us are mind readers and so we don't know. Um, but so in, in one sense, it's is asking, but a even more empathic way is to come up with some ideas of what you think might help and then ask if those would be helpful. Um, I've gotten into trouble where I've come up with some really good ideas, I thought, and I just did them. And then they weren't actually helpful. And the, the person did not appreciate that. And then my rejection wound got hit. And then I was, I was offended. Um, and if I had just used a little bit of words and said, hey, would this be helpful? They would have said, no, but this would be helpful. And that probably would have solved a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But my heart was in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, so I love, as you're asking the question, that you can see the pain of your wife. Um, and you can see the pain that she's dealing with, with the possible loss of her sister and the loss of the relationship that she's had with you in the, from what she thought it was to what it is. 
um, oftentimes when we're working with with affairs or other things, we talk to the partners, uh, we talk to the couple about the old relationship is dead. And so we need to bury that old relationship, what we thought it was, how much it was, we have to bury that. And so it's a, it's a kind of a loss that you're going through. And in the process, we create a new relationship, a new one where there aren't any secrets, there aren't any lies, there's openness and transparency, and it can be a beautiful transformation, but it's a loss. So you're recognizing that your your wife is feeling lost from two, two places, loss of that relationship with you and loss from sister. So part of it is what can you do to help show up? What can you do to help provide comfort? What can you do to help um, around the house? I don't know if y'all have children or just laundry or things that maybe your partner does that that you could take off of her shoulders for a little while to help lessen the load, those kind of things. Um, I don't think you ever have to, well, maybe not. Maybe your spouse really has a certain way to do the laundry, but even if it was picking up the laundry and putting it in the basket, I don't think you ever have to ask anybody if you should do that. But but um, those kind of things where you can say, hey, would it be helpful if I did this? And then do it. Um, that Look at the burdens that your wife has and ask yourself, what could I do to lessen this burden a little bit? Is there something I could do to make a difference? And then just check in with her. I, I went to the practical things too, and, and, and yes, communicating, but, but, you know, like giving her the capacity and space to, um, it, it, you know, to connect with her sister on whatever level that is, if they're not, an, I mean, does she need to fly to someplace, I mean, you know, to, to go see, I don't know, whatever it is, but I was like in that time to me, and, and it would be good to ask her you and the healing that's a long time journey but this one feels like it's really immediate so um helping her have the bandwidth to be able to you know connect with her sister and family and whatever it is you know that that looks like but yeah i'm really practical yeah if you, you do the laundry you know do the dishes do the grocery shop, what you know whatever it is that still needs to be done um but you know can be taken off of of her load would be I, I think hopeful, but I, I really appreciate that you're asking, you know, on a lot of levels too, it is you showing up and Troy mentioned it, you showing up and do it. You're like, if you say you're going to do something, do it, you know? Um, uh, but also make sure you're taking care of your recovery work because you adding a, a slipper relapse to this burden is right. not going to help. So, so yeah. making sure that you're doing what you need to do on a daily basis to, you know, to be on the recovery journey, check in with your, your sponsor, your peer group, your therapist, all of those things. Um, because it, you know, it, it, it's a lot for each and both of you too. Okay. Glad, next. I'm glad, Go ahead. You said, I'm glad you said that, um, about yeah, having a relapse or a slip in on top of that is not going to make it better. So do yeah. what you can for your recovery too. Yeah. Um, I noticed that partner only communicates his needs, thoughts, and love when we are in bed, ready to go to sleep. A lot of times I'm already half asleep. I would love to communicate with him, but it seems like he only feels safe then. Any advice? I can't, I cannot tell you how many couples tell me this. And it's uh, really, yes, oh, that's interesting. Often the, the wife, oh. often the wife who's doing that, um, it, it doesn't say who this is, but it, it's often the the wife who wants to talk as the as the um partner is going to bed um but you did say he only feels safe then so um uh and i think part of that is uh, like for a lot of women they've been they've been dealing with kids all day you know especially if they're a stay at home mom um they've been dealing with kids and even if they're not a stay at home if they're at work they it's extra right yeah their their job and then their other job um and so they're exhausted and so finally they're in bed and then they really want to talk and their husband is like ready to fall asleep so that is a challenge that a lot of couples have had um and don't have a like really good solution other than that is that is the pattern and talking about that pattern like hey i've noticed that when we we you want to have some serious conversations and i'm nearly passed out 
by that time. And I'm not showing up in my best self. And you then probably feel abandoned, neglected, and rejected because I'm falling asleep. Um, and so this this pattern isn't working. So what can what else can we do? Can we can we set time earlier in the day, make that a commitment? Can I like take um can I schedule like take my lunch break and we do this? over the phone or we do like what else can we do to do that because I want to show up for you and I know that it's it hurts you that I'm falling asleep so being able to talk about the dilemma but that is a that is a pattern that I've seen a lot a lot a lot um part of it is also checking in with the partner who's falling asleep and seeing if there's any avoidance that might be happening mm. as part of their way of not wanting to deal with things but the other part is like sometimes these conversations will go for an hour or two and the person really does have to go to work the next day and they don't function very well so identifying this is a pattern what solutions can we do can we do can we get up earlier in the morning can we go for a walk together can we have coffee before the day starts taking away? What can we do to really connect? Because I, I want to connect with you. And this doesn't seem to be working. I, I'm a big fan of scheduling time, you know, and say, we're going to, I'm going to write myself notes so that I remember to bring this up. But you, then it's a planned time. It's an appointment. That we've committed to this. But I was, I, I, it rarely happens. But, you know, if my husband says something, I am, I am, really good early in the morning and I'm really bad, you know, in the evening, I just tank. And so, so if he says something and it's like, all of a sudden I'm wide awake and I don't sleep, you know? So, so not only would the conversation cut into my sleep, but then my mind going, you know, does too. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, he's, he's learned that he'll never get the best um, outcome <laughs> if we continue that. So I was like, we can talk about anything, but it needs to be in a place when I actually have the mental capacity to show up. So, <laughs> and not when my head's on the pillow. So, but I love the idea of like communicating about, you know, not communicating about the stuff that you're communicating about once, you know, once you're in bed, but communicating about this, you know, I, I want to show up for you. This is a pattern that you know, we keep doing, but, you know, if we want to get some different results, you know, um, what are our options? I, you know, and then it's problem solving together too, you know, with a mutual goal of making it better. Other mm -hmm. questions, come on, people, we've got time and we've got Troy Love here for. We usually run out of time. I know, that's what, yeah. We should, we should have copied and pasted some of those other questions from there. Okay. Yeah, and then I'd have to like remember them for a month, you know. So, right. <laughs> yeah. I don't I'm going like, what did I do to yesterday, you know? So, <laughs> and well, so the the class is coming up with seeking integrity for those who maybe want to know a little bit more. That um, I walk. That is for men who want to do a little bit more deep dive into the attachment wounds and the process of how to help heal those, how they're connected to your addiction um, and what happens when we start to heal some of those wounds or we do wound care around those wounds and how that can impact and positively our, our recovery um, it can actually help us have more empathy, show up better for our partners, can also um, help us have more compassion, develop more shame resilience. So those kind of things that uh, maybe you would like to have in your life. So if you feel like you have a desire to have more joy and more love and connection in your relationship, that's what this class is about. So. Well, and it's not just a relationship with, I mean, yes, focusing on a primary relationship, but these are skills that we utilize with uh, our, any human connection, you know, uh, kids, coworkers, family members, you know, like this is how we can show up differently rather than, you know, going to those shame voices and, you know, being heard, you know, coming on uh, like, like the, the acting 
with things that are protecting us rather than, you know, connecting in real and meaningful ways. So, so yes, often coming for a primary relationship, but, but just good skills for life. Right. We've had a lot of single, single men come uh, or men who are not in a current relationship and they have found that very valuable as well. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause otherwise you repeat the same patterns that you had in a previous relationship so learning how to go, hmm, maybe I should do something different, you know, is, is really helpful. Well, oh, we got a question. Yay. Oh, got two of them. What are the signs, behaviors that our partners are staying emotionally, mentally sober from sex addiction? That's a great question. I love that. Um, so the first answer that pops up is that they don't lie about little things. Um, if they're if, so oftentimes we lie about stupid stuff like um what we had for lunch or where we spent you know how much we spent here or there and we they we, we lie about stupid stuff so that's one of the the big things is like are you telling the truth are you speaking truth are you being honest so that's one of the signs. Like if you notice that they're starting to like tell little white lies, that's a little red flag. That doesn't mean that they've acted out per se, but it means that they are, they're, they're circling the drain as it were. What's going on with them that they feel like they need to cover stuff up because we want to be able to live authentic in lives with integrity and, and honesty. And so that is one of those. So um, being able, when, if they, Another part of that is, are they following through with what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it? So are they keeping their commitments? So if they said they were going to be home at five, are they home at five? And if they're not home at five, did they check in with you and say, hey, I'm running just a few minutes late. I'm going to be home at 545 and then they're home at 545 so that they they keep their word. That, that's a huge part of that. Emotionally. Um, some of the signs of that is that they, their their emotions are up and down. Now, sometimes somebody might have, um, you know, some other co-occurring issues like bipolar disorder or depression or something like that, and hopefully they're being treated for that. But their emotions are more consistent, so they're not angry and and they're not super depressed, but there there's more of a a levelness in that, and so you can. You can feel safe around their emotions. You're not like walking on eggshells thinking mm. that I'm going to say something and they're going to blow up and get mad at me. Um, oftentimes, I will say, oftentimes what happens with an addict is once they've they've gotten some sobriety under their belt, well, they've been using their drug of choice, porn or whatever, as a way of um, numbing their emotion. And so now I've I've stopped numbing and now the emotions are there. And so there is going to be a fluctuating sense of emotion at the beginning because they've never learned how to manage those emotions. They've just numbed them. But if they are in recovery for a while and they've started to learn how to do that, you should be able to see some um, some flow, some ups and downs, but not like spikes. So those are some things to help. Um, mentally, um, they are. there's a lot of parallel between individuals who have ADHD and individuals who are addicts. So if they really don't have ADHD, um, but they've been, their brain has been acting that way, when they start to be in some recovery, they're able to focus longer, they're able to pay attention longer, they're able to make better decisions, those kind of things. So those, those we call them executive functioning skills, they, they manage those really well. I will say that there are many addicts that I've met who do have ADHD that has been untreated. So if we actually can treat that, their addictive behaviors go down because they aren't self-medicating anymore. And then the same thing happens. They're able to make better decisions. They're able to communicate better. They regulate their emotions better. So those are some of the signs that we can see that somebody's being healthy is that they, they're doing those kind of things. What you mentioned ADHD, and there it seems to be a higher correlation within addiction. How, and, but you know, addicts, you know, addicts come off as narcissistic. They come off with it, you know, as um, 
low impulse controls. So, so having someone really identify you know, what is going on and if medication is needed, you know, um, uh, but going to a doctor and telling them that you have ADHD and them having, giving you pills isn't the right solution. Um, so this is Troy Love, Dr. Todd Love. It gets me very confused. I've accidentally emailed them the wrong one. Um, but he did a webinar on ADHD and how untreated, you know, how problematic it is. So, so like at our treatment program, you know, if somebody is on meds for ADHD, we're, we don't tell them that they have to stop, you know, that's part of, that's part of, and there are some programs that, oh no, you're medicating. No, it's, you know, it's life changing, you know, and same with OCD. I mean, there's, there's a number of things that, you know, may need some, some medical um, intervention. You talked about lying, and I th it, we were just talking about this with the with a team meeting uh, this morning with our treatment program. But you know how addicts, um, like you know, uh, people come in, and we know a lot because we do a very thorough intake process, you know, with each person. But then there's always more is revealed, and you know, you know, it's like addicts lie, but they lie to themselves as well. So when you're talking about you know telling the truth, it's also that we're you know, we're truthful to ourselves, you know, we're, we're owning our stuff. Um, but I think that settling too, you know, I mean, when I first got into recovery, the pendulum, you know, like the only time I was in the middle was when I was passing through to the other side. So, so, you, you know, I, do I have swings? Sure. But they're way smaller than they, they used to be. Um, you know, I, I live more in serenity, but this is a journey. This is not something I was talking to somebody the other day and their person had um, stopped a couple of months ago with the behaviors and they're looking for way deep stuff. And I'm like, you know, like that's an unrealistic expectation, you know, for, you know, for an addict, you know, we're never fixed, you know, like this is a journey. You Troy and I are talking about like, we've been at this a while and we still have, you know, we're open and willing to do more work. That's the beauty of it, it's also kind of a pain in the neck. We'd like to be all better, but you know, we're not. So, but but we can continue to learn and grow. So, but if you're seeing, you know, um, because you're asking about like what what would you see? You will you will make it there will be noticeable changes. It won't be perfect, but you'll start to see, you know, the, 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 the little shifts. And if a lie is told, if somebody's coming to you, you know, there's the plan, the 24 hour plan, or even shorter, if you, whatever you guys have agreed to, but coming to you and say, you know, when I said that, that wasn't truthful, you know, I need to own that, you know, that's what, you know, that's what recovery is. It's not that we do it perfectly, that we clean up our messes. So. How important is it for the sex addict to be consistent in his daily actions and how does consistency, consistency create change? Great question. I think it's really important. Um, it, it does a couple of things, but um, oftentimes in addiction, we have not developed stamina um, and we have not developed uh, now, what's the word? Uh, it's not a dedication. It will come to me. But um, so we we haven't developed habits. We have some habits that are not healthy, but we haven't developed some healthier habits. It's all about neuro neurostructure. What's happened in the brain is that over time, because they kept acting out and acting out, there's actually a neural network of of neural connections that happen that when the person is feeling pain, they imagine their brain says, well, this is how we solve that problem. And so we have to build a new neural structure. We have to start building that and it happens one day at a time. And so we do some daily actions, whether that's meditation or going to a meeting or journaling or whatever the dailies are that they do, and they're able to be consistent with that. It's creating new neural pathways in their brain. We're learning something new. And then once that neural pathway is in place, now we have some choices. Before, uh, it sounds kind of weird, but before in the addiction, there weren't a whole lot of choices because our brain had 
not learn any other capacity, but now we have other choices and I've strengthened those and I've reinforced those neural networks in my brain so that now I can make better decisions and I have the capacity to do so because I've been practicing them every day. So really important. Um, and we've learned so much in the last 10 years, especially about the plasticity of the brain and the importance of doing these kind of um, structured things to make recovery so much better. It's it, daily practice helps tremendously. I, I go with critically important when, when I, I get this a lot. I talk to lots of people. So, you know, I get this a lot. Well, you know, and it's often from the trade partners, but sometimes from the addict. Well, I'm going to see my therapist once a week and, you know, and I go to one meeting a week and I'm like, okay, so you're doing an hour and 50 minutes of work on your 24 seven problem that you had for decades. See where I'm going with that? It's like, this is a chronic condition. And, and so the, when people, I, I often say, what are, what it, what are you doing on a daily basis? Because you know what, if I go to a, my 12 step meeting or a drop in group or this, I am probably going to be good for a little bit. I'm probably going to, you know, not be thinking, oh, I need to go act out, go back to the, you know, the same old patterns, even like I have walked out of a meeting and been all Zen and then stuff hits the fan, shall we say? And, you know, I go, wow, it almost wiped it all out. And I thought, no, it doesn't. It, you know, like I still have the capacity because I, you know, I did what I needed to do, but you know, like my Zen was gone for a second, but it was gone for a second. And then I've got the tools to use and the support to lean into. So, so yeah, this is, you know, it, it, you know, and, and people can go, yeah, I started looking at porn at age, whatever, or I started doing whatever at age, but the wounds, the stuff that you, that we're, we're talking about, the choice that's young. I mean, infancy or young child stuff. So, uh, you know, stopping the problematic behavior is abstinence. That's great. You know, get chips and, and truly I celebrate, but, it, you know, but continuing to do that deeper work and, you know, and heal those wounds that we we're talking about at the beginning, you know, even if it's pieces of it, but wow, that piece doesn't hurt anymore. That's great. So I've got freedom from that particular piece. Great. So, so we are the rewards of doing the daily work are exponentially better than living in addiction so but you know we we don't get the we don't get the benefits if we're not willing to do the work so okay next question sa spouse is struggling with childhood trauma and how it has impacted his path of addiction would your workshop be appropriate for him yes um so it's an educational class it's not it's not therapy just, um, but it's still, um, I'll, oftentimes what happens with the guys in the uh, group and even people who go to the retreats and other things is they take what they've learned in the class and they go to their licensed therapist in their area and it helps deepen the experience that they're having in, in their treatment model. So um, what it does is it really helps a person be able to see that they're not flawed and defective because of their addiction, that they've really been trying to deal with some underlying pain. So it increases self-compassion um, and empathy for themselves, which is huge because shame doesn't help, by the way. Um, so being able to do that and then being able to use that awareness to do some deeper work around that. Um, whether it's Eddie Caparucci's work around healing their wounded child or those kind of things, it creates a vocabulary to to take to their therapist and say, I figured out I got a, an abuse wound that's been there since I was three, and I can see why I'm doing that stuff. And so it helps put some pieces in place. I And I so appreciate you saying it like that, because I have a lot of therapists that recommend our work groups. It's psychoeducation. It is not treatment. It is not therapy. But but they see, just like you said, that their clients are coming back with, here's some, you know, here's some discoveries I've made. And I also, I love, I recommend often both your attachment wound and the inner child. I think the combination of those two, I think they're both great, but, and whichever order you take them in, but I think having the, the scope 
scope and the language to be able to talk about those things is, is really beneficial. So I put the link in the chat, you know, all of the um, work groups are on the seekingintegrity.com site. There's lots of opportunities. You can always email me uh, about any of that too. Okay, next question. I have been single most of my life. I desire intimate relationships, not just friends, which I have many of, but in romance, I seem to intrinsic or instinctively seek needy people like my mom or narcissistic avoidant people like my dad. I worry that I really just don't know myself very well. So my question is, can you speak to strategies for truly talking and listening to myself instead of just living a script um, even when journaling, I feel like I'm performing. Wow, that's a very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, thank you. Um, I think you know yourself more than you've given yourself credit. I, I also am hearing, I'm hearing a couple of things. You're lonely and you absolutely want a relationship. And I think that's really important. And you've noticed some patterns. I just saw something in social media a couple of days ago and it resonates i don't know if it's scientifically true but it resonates with me um where it says so you've met somebody and then you feel those butterfly feelings in your stomach and you're so excited and you think it's because you're falling in love but actually those butterfly feelings are picking up on the signs that this person is acting very much like your abusive father oh, interesting um, so it's your fight or flight response that's actually kicking up but we think it's butterfly feelings because we we our brain is faster at picking that stuff up than, than and like our back of our brain is faster than picking up the front part of our brain. And so it's picking up stuff. And so we're reacting and thinking, oh, I'm in love with this person. When no, actually I'm terrified of this person, but it feels like love because I'm so familiar with that relationship. So that, um, that resonated with me um, that that might be the case. So you've been able to identify the pattern. And you also are identifying that you feel like you're performing. So what I'm hearing is that the shadow of shame that might be operating is the is the politician that's having you like put on a mask, even for yourself. Mm -hmm. So even the politician is writing your journal entries for you instead of you. So one of the things you may want to do is let your politician write the journal entry on the left side and then ask yourself how much of that is actually true. And then let your true self write another journal entry on the right side of the page and see if it matches. See if there's things that are different, see if there's things that are the same. You also, um, I, I, I think I know who you are. I think you live in a place where there may not be as many resources for therapists for you to be able to, to do some of that work, but you've noticed that there is a pattern. And you've also noticed that this is something that you want to break. So part of that is identifying, well, what kind of relationship do you want to have? What would that look like? Can you imagine what that would look like? Can you journal and even do some law of attraction stuff? Okay, so a long time ago, a book called The Secret came out. Lots of people thought it was just magical thing. I think there's some things I like about it. What I don't like about it is it just like if you just imagine it, then magical things happen to you. And that part I don't think is true. However, I think the imagining part of that is really important. What kind of a person do you want to attract in your life? And being able to have a sense of what that looks like, who that looks like, what would you do with that person? And knowing that and then the part that the secret doesn't talk about is what can I do to help make that happen? What kind of, where do I need to go? Where do those people hang out? What are the, where do those people do stuff? Where, what kind of things do I need to change in my life so I can connect with those people? That part is some things what I don't do because my judge or my impotent one says, well, it's just not going to work out. Uh, it's just, I don't even know why you bother, but it's probably, you're just going to have to be lonely for the rest of your life. Recognize that shame is hijacking all that. So giving your per permission to imagine what that would be like, and then noticing which shadows of shame hijack that. And also, um, it's helpful if you have some, some trusted advisors in your life, because they will see things that you don't see. 
um, to ask them, hey, so I'm starting to date this person. What are some of the red flags that you're seeing? Let me bring them over. What are some red flags? Because they may pick up on stuff that you don't see. And so doing it as a collaborative effort, those are some things you can do so that you maybe are honoring yourself um, and not setting yourself up for another failure and having your judge and your impotent one say, see, you're just going to be lonely for the rest of your life. But to be able to do that more mindfully. Um, the fact that you're asking me this question and the fact that you are seeing the pattern tells me you do know yourself a whole lot more than you're giving yourself credit for. And I want to honor that. And I think it's fair to say, oh, that's my mom's voice. Oh, that's my dad's voice. And it, it, like, I think you know that. So, uh, and, and I want to affirm, you deserve to have somebody who is a partner for you, who values you for who you are, not a facade of what you're, you're putting on for you. So I so appreciate you being here and sharing this question because it's a great one. Okay. Hi, Troy and Tammy. My husband has been in recovery for nine months. Three weeks at SI followed by twice a week. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. SI work groups. Okay. Uh, let's go with the online work groups and 12 steps and sponsor. He is still being ultra reactive, avoidant, and defensive about everything to the point that we can't have a conversation anymore without it ending badly. Is this normal? Because I'm at the end of my rope. Uh, is it normal? Yes. Yeah. Is it okay? No, no. Uh, if a person, okay, there's a couple of things. I, I don't know who this person is and that's okay. Um, so there are, there, there are a couple of things that I would be looking at if I were involved in this case. Number one, is there like a personality disorder that might be playing a role here? Because if there's a personality disorder and lots of people are really quick to like say somebody's a narcissist or whatever. Yeah. I'm not saying that. If there really is, though, that means their capacity for empathy is really, really small, uh, maybe non-existent. And so that is something to kind of, that's what I'd be looking at, trying to rule that out. Most people do not fit in that category, by the way. So there's a small percentage of people. Most people their capacity for empathy is not great because their shame is so profound. And that because their shame is so large, their capacity to be able to hear somebody else's pain is non-existent. So I look at uh, shame and empathy are on uh, on the same spectrum. So the, the more that you're wanting him to show up and and show up with more empathy and ownership and that kind of stuff and be more over here. And he, he's the way he's responding that avoidant, reactive, defensive shows me he is way, way on the other side of that spectrum with shame. And even though groups help with that, and even though all of that helps with that, that's still where he's at. Um, and, and if a person is over there, that behavior is normal. Um, I, I, there's not a better word for it. It is normal, but that doesn't mean that that it's okay. And it, it definitely is not going to help with the relationship. Um, and I'm hearing that you're at the end of your rope. You're like, I need some ownership. I need to be able to talk about my experiences and the pain that I'm feeling and the things that I need without it always coming into a fight. And if that isn't the case we continue to like the we try to show up and continue to do our work and the other person isn't there yet then that's you having to sit with some questions that you're going to have to sit with and maybe some hard conversations with him and saying your shame is so profound that i can't have conversations with you i'm not sure how much longer this relationship is going to work um, because I can't, I can't do that anymore. So I need you to work on some over your shame stuff because I'm not sure. I would hope that you have some support for you. Um, we have the dropping groups that are available for the, the partners, hoping that maybe you have a, a therapist who's familiar with betrayal trauma, who can also be a support for you. There's several, um, 
of, of the people who have, we have classes, I think, for betrayed partners with Seeking Integrity too. Um, there's resources for boundaries and all those kind of things that are available for you. Um, because I hear how intolerable that is, and I don't want you to have to endure that, and you shouldn't have to. Um, so we can only work on ourselves and we can only connect with our sense of I'm enough and I'm worthy of, of a relationship where somebody takes ownership of their behavior and tries to make amends. And I'm willing to do that for him. And I'm, and I'm worthy of somebody doing that for me. And I'm, I'm worthy of being treated with dignity and respect and stepping into that space and then letting that guide how you then respond and what you do. I, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I'm really sad because, you know, this person has been given tools and clearly they're laying on the ground and not being picked up, you know, they're, they, you know, rather than being reactive or avoidant, you know, sitting, you know, Troy talked about it earlier, we have to be okay with being a little uncomfortable, like, it's all uncomfortable when we're new in recovery, this feels like very early recovery nine months is is good it's a journey you know it takes you know, two to three years to have you know a really or sometimes even longer but 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 you're not seeing signs of his ability to you know create that safe space to have a discussion you know we've talked before about having you know a 20 minute time frame on you know in 10 minutes each or or you know perhaps you say i'm curious what what are you looking you know what is your intention when you're avoidant or when you're reactive, what, what are you, what is your goal in, you know, in, in doing that and maybe just slowing down the process. Um, if you can hold the space so that you're not stepping into the reactive or avoiding because, oh, he's blowing up, um, you know, it, you know, if you can be a little curious about that, maybe he can go, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm scared. I'm full of shame. I'm whatever. Um, but I honor what Troy said, you know, at some point, you know, you deserve to have somebody who's really able to take responsibility for their actions. And if, you know, with the work that he's done this far, you're not seeing that paying dividends, then um, tough situation and tough questions to ask. So I have a recurring scary dream of someone with a hidden face grabbing me and pulling me into a dark place. I believe the faceless person is my inner child traumas. I want to speak with this faceless person in my dreams so I can sit with them in their pain and work through it. But each time I'm confronted in my dream, I get scared and run away. Then I wake up. How can I stay in the dream so I can talk to my inner child there? So there are some people who knew, know how to do like lucid dreaming. I'm not one of those people. However, if you happen to have somebody who is skilled with hypnosis, um, mm. they probably can take you there. Um, so somebody in your area who knows how to do that can help you confront that um, part of you, or even a skilled therapist who can help even do some like grounding meditation kind of stuff in a relaxed place and um, doing what we call like empty chair technique where we pull that um, faceless person out and they're sitting across the, the the room from you and you have a conversation with them so there's some different ways to do that um, I don't know how to tell you how to do lucid dreaming because I don't know how to do that but there are some people so I'm sure if you google that somebody can teach you but that's a that's a skill that takes some time to learn how to do so you, a faster way may be to find a, a licensed hypnotherapist in your area that could do that yeah well, you know and I I've experienced with my therapist doing visualization of of you going back and supporting the younger child hugely beneficial for me I was awake but um but I wasn't struggling with the dreams but I you know like I, I think she was doing some EMDR with me at the same time and made a, such a huge difference so um so I love that you're asking the question and and wanting to you know go back and support that inner child um, um but yeah try try any of those that seem like a, a fit start somewhere and and uh, keep keep poking away if it doesn't work so 
Okay, next question. Betrayed partner, why do addicts tell little white lies about things that seemingly have nothing to do with their addiction, like what they had for lunch? My SA partner has always told little white lies and exaggerations. His parents and I just thought he was compulsive liar at the, on top of being an SA. So they lie because they're trying to avoid their perception of rejection, neglect, abandonment, betrayal. And so they they have convinced themselves or their shadows have convinced them to, to lie about stupid stuff um, because they're afraid. Like if I told you the truth about what I had for lunch, you're going to reject me. So it's their own story that they have in their head. It's not based in a, a sense of reality. It could have come from past wounds where that those kind of things happened. Um, there, there are people though that also have a mental illness where they are, they just lie. So, um, but most of the time they're trying to avoid pain. It doesn't make any sense to the rest of us. Why are you lying about lunch? Like not that big a deal. Um, but their fear of rejection, abandonment, betrayal, all that stuff is what compels them to lie. And until they can confront that and recognize nobody's doing that, you're actually doing that to yourself, that behavior is not going to change. But that's the difference in recovery is we quit lying about all that stuff, you know, and, and it's a process and it doesn't get better automatically and i'm not telling tales out of school because um my colleague scott has talked about sitting in a 12-step meeting the safest place on the planet and lying and he had to stop and go wait i'm i'm telling a lie the insanity of the lies it makes no sense but it it is it is something that we have to work on but you know i love that our program is called seeking integrity integrity is you know we, we do our best to tell the truth you know as transparently as as possible and clean up anything, you know, where we've aired. So next question. My partner says he is being sober from sex addiction. He also, uh, he was also smoking marijuana for past years. He stopped both behaviors. I noticed he has tried to smoke marijuana again. He smoked some cigarettes here and there. I'm afraid that if he loses sobriety with marijuana, it can trigger the other one. Yes. And Dr. David Fawcett, please uh, join his webinar tonight. He is magic on this stuff he but he's if you are smoking marijuana vaping any of that you are nine times more likely to relapse across the board it keeps that dopamine drip going so so your fear is justified the other thing i notice is he says he is sober from sex addiction we just talked about addicts lie to ourselves and everyone else so um so it, yeah, yeah. Healthy boundaries for you, but Troy, what do you have got to say on this oh, one? Amen to that. Amen. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not anti marijuana. There's, it serves a purpose for some people, but in addiction, um, in those kind of things, it's a red flag. And so it's always something that I sit down with somebody who's in recovery and talk about, like, okay, what's the motive around this? What's going on with that? Um, so they, they can be fully transparent and honest so uh, yeah exactly yeah please check out dr Fawcett's stuff he's the yeah. expert on that yeah he's 5 p.m tonight on sex and relationship healing.com so and then this will be the last one i will i will capture the questions and save them for next month i'll put them i'll look okay. in a safe place so okay as a betrayer, are there milestones in recovery where triggers or lapses, relapses are more likely to occur? And how long does it take to redevelop those neural pathways? That's a great question. Kind of like where where do you have to be extra vigilant? Uh, so it, from what I have learned, it takes about a year to two years to develop those neural pathways. And there, um, and there are some contingencies around that. Like if a person relapses, it can reset it. Um, so they actually starts over um, when they, um, so it's like they have to have some ongoing sobriety uh, and then it will, is, but ongoing sobriety and it still will take about a year to two years for those neural, neural pathways to be um, connected. So, are there milestones um, uh, or you're asking where triggers and relapses? Everybody's different. Um, so I don't know if there's milestones for that, but uh, somebody could be 
in recovery for a really long time and then something will trigger them. And there's some people that they can't seem to get a day of sobriety on, on them. So everybody has a little bit of a different reason why they're doing it. But for me, they're all connected to the attachment wounds. Something's triggering that attachment wound and their brain is saying, well, this is how I manage that pain. This is how I manage that pain. Um, and until they've learned some new ways to manage their pain, they're going to keep relapsing. Yeah, you know, and I, I, like um, we talk about the pink cloud, you know, uh, early in recovery, like people go, oh, my life is great now, you know, because I've got, um, you know, like I I see the, the new path and then reality hits, you know, because like some negative consequences can go away fairly early in recovery, but then, you know, then there's life. So, um, and I think milestones, you know, like, six months and a year. I can't unfortunately tell you how many people, the, the challenge is as soon as you think you've got this, that's a huge red flag. If you think, oh, I've got this recovery thing, you know, uh, and it's in my back pocket and you quit doing the things that work. I mean, I know people that have been in long-term recovery um, and then they stop doing meetings. They stop seeing whatever. They stop doing all the things that work for them for years. And then they're then all of a sudden they've relapsed so so it is we we started out with what do you need to do on a daily basis and you know even at this point I still you know have my meditation I I think uh, uh or I do something active for for recovery because I just value it so much and it keeps my life mostly sane so <laughs> okay yeah. So I saved the questions, um, uh, come back next month. Um, next week is the fifth week of the month. So there won't be a Wednesday morning. And then Alex Avila has started his 40 forms of intimacy. So he's the first week of the month. Um, uh, so he just started in August. So um, he'll be continuing on that. So join us again then. But Troy has on alternating Thursdays, a drop-in group for betrayed partners. And then every Friday morning, he's on the sex and relationship healing.com site, you know, doing the finding peace, you know, on a drop-in basis, very different than a work group. So, um, so, uh, you know, keep that in mind, but uh, for guys sign up for that finding peace work group that starts in September, you won't be disappointed. So. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.